pleasure to be here and to join you. I think it's it's impossible to start this session uh, about essentially the birth of the state of Israel without recognizing the current agony I know many of us will feel over another nation's uh, struggle for independence. Uh, in the case of Ukraine, to, to cling on to its independence in truly dire circumstances. And while this session is about history rather than law, um, I'll allow myself just one preliminary aside, if I may, in light of the horrific developments over the past week in Europe and the frequency with which uh, breaches of international law are being cited. It's um, a significant lament of mine that misrepresentations over the application of international law to the emergence of Israel and the legitimacy of the Jewish state over the decades have served to uh, politicize and cheapen international law and, and degrade the international legal order. Now, that is not to suggest, of course, that Putin would have necessarily acted differently, uh, just to say that it is most unfortunate that the abuse of international law and of the terminology of legal condemnation with respect to Israel has seemingly blunted uh, the tools in respect of the real violations of international law we have witnessed over the last week uh, and even undermined the authority of international law. Uh, and I think we'll come on to see why that might be relevant to some of the aspects that we're speaking about today. So with that, um, to the subject of today's session and the period, forgive me, as I had it, 1947 to 1949. Um, but I see, uh, of course, that that is also now subtitled From War to Independence, which we may have to take brief issue with simply on the basis that it was Israel's proclamation of statehood or Declaration of Independence, which, uh, as we will see, led to its neighbors engaging in that war of attempted annihilation that was Israel's in independence war. But it is also correct that before the British left, at the end of the mandate, before the Declaration of Independence, uh, as discussed in the last session on this program, there was a civil war waging between the local Jewish Palestinian and Arab Palestinian populations. Now there are likely many hundreds of books that have been written about this period and we simply won't be able to do justice to the wealth of scholarship in the course of the hour that we have together. So with Michael's encouragement, I propose to focus on three bullet points for us to review these together and to leave as much time as possible for questions and discussion. The first is the 1947 Partition Resolution, uh, where we can look at its practical as well as its legal impact. Second, I propose to pick up on a recent book by Professor Eliezer Tauber. He's a professor at Bailan University, and the book is called The Massacre That Never Was, The Myth of Dir Yassin and the Creation of the Palestinian Refugee Problem. And finally, I'll look at the Declaration of Independence in light of a very interesting series of essays by Martin Kramer in Mosaic magazine, which went into fascinating detail on its birth as well as its symbolic and practical significance. So to start with the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 181, I appreciate we have with us many very learned uh, and engaged uh, audience and you will all no doubt be familiar with the resolution. The area of Palestine had been governed via a mandate by the British since 1922. The British having lost the will to continue with that arrangement, referred the matter to the United Nations in April, 1947, and the UN Special Committee on Palestine was established to develop a proposal, continuing the Western tradition of drawing lines in the Middle East. It suggested two separate states joined in an economic union. Now on the 29th of November, 1947, the General Assembly of the UN voted on the issue and the resolution passed by 33 votes against, uh, sorry, 33 votes for, uh, 13 against and 10 abstentions. And I expect many of us are familiar with the footage of the celebrations in the Yeshuv. That was a proposal that ultimately 
won support from the local Jewish population, but it was um, flatly rejected uh, by uh, all the Arabs, leadership and general populations. Now, a common misconception is that this provided the basis for the establishment of the State of Israel, or that the resolution and the borders that it proposed had some legally binding effect in international law. General Assembly resolutions are not legally binding. They are termed recommendations, and they essentially represent the views of the states voting. They are political statements. The only law-making resolutions that the UN is able to uh, issue are via the Security Council, and then only in specific circumstances if they are made under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, that is the governing document of the United Nations, setting out the competences of each of the composite institutions as well as the legislative processes. Resolutions made under Chapter 7 are the strongest legal tool in the UN legislative box, and they're very rarely made. Such a resolution is immediately binding on all member states, and it's, of course, much, much harder to pass a resolution that has legal teeth. So there's no binding resolution. There's no agreement between the parties due to uh, the Arab rejection of the proposals. But the passing of the resolution did have an effect in that it led to a significant uptick in what has been called the, the civil war preceding the departure of the British and Israel's independence. Now, the US uh, Office of the Historian, um, the official government office of, of the historian, has described this as follows. The United Nations resolution sparked conflict between Jewish and Arab groups within Palestine. Fighting began with attacks by irregular bands of Palestinian Arabs attached to local units of the Arab Liberation Army composed of volunteers from Palestine and neighboring Arab countries. These groups launched their attacks on uh, against, forgive me, Jewish cities, settlements and armed forces. The Jewish forces were composed of the Haganah, the underground militia of the Jewish community, and two small irregular groups, the Irgun and Lehi. The goal of the Arabs was initially to block the partition resolution and to prevent the establishment of the Jewish state. The Jews, on the other hand, hoped to gain control over the territory allotted to them under the partition plan. And it was in the context of this civil war that we come to the subject of Dir Yassin and the battle on the 9th of April, 1948. Since the adoption of the partition resolution, Jewish Jerusalem had been under siege. The failure of the Jewish Yeshuv to cope effectively with the Arab challenge across the area and specifically in Jerusalem caused many to fear that the UN would retract its support for the formation of a Jewish state altogether. In early April 1948, the Haganah launched Operation Nachshon, and Professor Tauber describes this as crossing the Rubicon. This was an operation aimed at opening the road to Jerusalem and removing the Arab siege. An unprecedented 1,500 men were allocated to the operation with the intention of conquering all the Arab villages endangering the road. Now, the Etzioni Brigade was uh, responsible for the portion of the road from Kiryat Anavim to Jerusalem. And this included the well-known battle for Castel, in which the preeminent Arab military leader, Abdul Qadir al Husseini, was killed. Now, when subsequently Arab fighters abandoned their positions in order to attend Husseini's funeral, they lost their advantage in the early hours of the 9th of April. The Haganah captured Castel for, for good. And this coincided with the forces of Etzel and Lehi fighting in Deir Yassin. The village of Deir Yassin was important strategically because of its proximity to, to, to the Jerusalem road, which was under attack. So taking the village was an essential part of the campaign to break that siege of Jerusalem. 
and members of the village were also fighting with the Arab military organization, the Army of Sacred Jihad, which had been led by Abdul Qadir al Husseini. In late December and early January, on several occasions, there was fire from Deir Yassin aimed at Givat Shaul. And so the Jews classified Deir Yassin as one of the hostile villages endangering the road from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. And there was also intelligence of uh, foreigners amassing in the village thought to be Iraqi soldiers. The propaganda that has reverberated around this incident and the allegation of a massacre has found great traction um, and has a truly profound impact both then and now. And this recent book goes into minute detail from eyewitness accounts and a compilation of evidence as to the development of the battle. It was far more fierce than the Lehi and Etzel forces who fought there had expected. Uh, Professor Tauber describes these units as young and inexperienced. The Lehi and Etzel forces met far more resistance than they anticipated. So there were gun positions installed on the roofs of many of the village houses, and there was a fierce exchange of fire. Survivor Aish Zaidan explained that the Arab combatants were fighting the Jewish fighters from house to house and from street to street. Now that was in contrast to battles, for example, at Castel. The battle for Deir Yassin took place in the presence of a non-combatant population. So combatants and non-combatants lived in the same houses. In many instances, the heads of the families with their sons or other relatives would shoot at the attackers from within the houses in the presence of the rest of their families and the Jewish combatants would return fire. According to most Arab sources, the Arab resistance terminated between 2 and 2.30 that afternoon uh, after about 10 consecutive hours of fighting. Uh, there was sporadic sniping that continued in the hours that followed, mainly from the surrounding hills dying down around dusk. Yeshua Zettler, the commander of Lehi in Jerusalem, later explained that although the original intention was to avoid the killing of women and children, the circumstances made it inevitable. It became a matter of life and death for the forces, he explained. If he lives, I will die. Now, Professor Eliezer Tauber carries out a careful analysis of each of the Arab casualties and the circumstances in which they were killed. There were between 70 to 80 Arab combatants in the village, and according to his list, 24 of the Arabs killed were amongst that number. But the question is not what was the ratio of combatants to non-combatants killed, but the circumstances in which they died. The exact number, um, forgive me, I should say the exact circumstances of the death of uh, 17 people out of the total of 101 remains unknown. According to the list Tauber compiles of the 84 people um, of the, the, that are remaining, 61 uh, were killed under battle conditions and others in the fog of war. Now his analysis also refutes the assertion by many that there were uh, two phases to the events in Diyasin, that after the battle ended and the Palmach had left, Etzel and Lehi uh, perpetuated a, a full-scale massacre. Now it's clear that most of the people were killed under battle conditions and not in any subsequent deliberate massacre. And when the battle ended, uh, the killing stopped. At about, uh, there were about 120 uh, Jewish forces in total uh, and 70 to 80 Arab combatants. And while the defenders uh, possessed the advantage of fighting from within the houses, the attackers were in the open, exposed to Arab fire. Now, I think it's uh, important to briefly look at this event through the lens of how it has been portrayed and the impact that the myth of Deir Yassin had in the immediate developments in that period and the source of the stories of, of slaughter and of rape. Um, one of the first to meet with the fugitives of Deir Yassin when they arrived in Arab Jerusalem was Hazim Nuseiba the Arabic news editor of the Palestine Broadcasting Service. Now, he asked Hussein al-Khaldi, 
the senior Arab authority in Jerusalem at the time, how he should cover the story. Kaldi's response was, we must make the most of this. I think we should give this the utmost propaganda possible because the Arab countries apparently are not interested in assisting us and we are facing a catastrophe. So Kaldi said, we are forced to give a, a picture not of what is actually happening, uh, but we had to exaggerate a little bit so that maybe the Arab countries would become enthusiastic to come and assist us. Kaldi also hoped that such stories would strengthen the, the Palestinian sumud, the determination to resist. And he issued uh, Nuseiba a strongly worded communique containing stories of rapes and all kinds of other atrocities, which was quickly broadcast and published all over the country. Now, some of the fugitives were, were summoned to Kaldi's headquarters um, and they were told, we want you to say that the Jews slaughtered people, committed atrocities, raped and, and stole gold. Uh, and when the fugitives protested against the false accounts of rape in particular, Kaldi insisted that they had to say so in order to pressure the Arab armies to free Palestine from the Jews. And um, many, many years ago, I came across a very interesting documentary by the BBC called 50 Years of Conflict. Some of you may be familiar with it, but I thought I'd just play a very short extract that includes a, uh, an interview with one of the uh, survivors and also that exchange, uh, which also uh, appears in, in the book that Talbot has written. We gathered in Jerusalem at the Hebron Gate. We checked who was missing and who had survived. Then the Palestinian leaders arrived, including Dr. Khalidi. I asked Dr. Khalidi how we should cover the story. He said, we must make the most of this. So he wrote a press release stating that at Deir Yassin, children were murdered, pregnant women were raped, all sorts of atrocities. Arab radio stations passed on the false reports, ignoring the protests of the witnesses. We said there was no rape. He said, we have to say this, so the Arab armies will come to liberate Palestine from the Jews. This was our biggest mistake. We did not realize how our people would react. As soon as they heard that women had been raped at Deir Yassin, Palestinians fled in terror. They ran away from all our villages. In the next few months, over half the Arab population, three quarters of a million people, fled their homes in Palestine. Explain at the beginning of the interviews on interviews response there isn't fully translated into English. In Arabic, he says there was no uh, slaughter, uh, izbih, and no rape. And he makes a cutting movement with his hands as he's speaking of slaughter, sort of pushing movement with his hands as he's speaking of rape. And of course, there follows that testimony of Nuseiba. I should say that he is a member of the old Nuseiba family, a, a very important family in East Jerusalem. And amongst uh, other posts, he was Jordan's Minister of Foreign Relations ambassador to Egypt and pers uh, permanent representative to the United Nations. He's also known as an important uh, figure in the movement for Arab nationalism. Um, and I think he gives a very um, honest uh, uh, interview there, not in any way um, serving his own purposes. Uh, as Nuseiba was to describe it, the accusations of rape touched a nerve in the Palestinian psyche, um, achieving as, uh, as Stuart was indicating, the exact opposite of what they had intended. The movement, uh, uh, sorry, I should say the moment that the, the Palestinians heard about the rape allegations, they rushed to escape from all over. Now, Meir Pa'il's account of the Deir Yassin affair became a cornerstone for the adherents of the false massacre narrative. 
His version, however, evolved over the um, course of the years, uh, bolstering the, the parallel reality that he created with various uh, new components, um, many of them were essentially no more than figments of, of his imagination. So he was not always con consistent in his accounts. For example, in some of his accounts, he joined the Etzel force, in others, he joined the Lehi force. In some of the testimonies, he tried to convince the attackers um, and the commanders to stop the carnage, while in others, he said he could do nothing. And the numbers of those he alleged were executed also fluctuated from five in his 1948 report to 30 in later accounts as did the number of Palmach men that he said were present. But one thing he did accept later in the developments of his accounts is that he was not at the battle himself. He did not see the killing. And when we consider that the myth was propagated by the Haganah only three months before the Altalina affair, I think we can see that as a result of the rivalry and the animosity which existed between Haganah and Etzel. Uh, the defamation of character here would appear only small in comparison with uh, Rabin's order to shoot them in the water. Now, Professor Tauber concludes that Dear Yassin was a tragedy by both the attacker's miscalculation and the defender's miscalculation and basic misunderstanding of the, of the nature of the event. Etzel and Lehi expected it to be an easy win it wasn't. The villagers expected the fighting to last two or three hours, after which uh, the attackers would retreat, and they were wrong. Diyasin was um, one of the first Arab villagers in the 1948 war that the Jews conquered and held for good. And that was a new phenomenon. The inhabitants didn't realize that the purpose of the attack differed from similar attacks that had been carried out earlier on. Uh, in other villages. They believed it to be another hit and run, uh, and that after blowing up several houses, there would be a retreat. And from their viewpoint, it, it seemed sensible to try and hold out until that occurred. And that was the tragic mistake. Etzel and Lehi needed to take hold of the village which controlled the road to Jerusalem. And Plan D, Tochnit Dalet of the Haganah, uh, framed in uh, early March of 1948, served as a guideline for Operation Nachshon and for the Haganah's countrywide offensive in April. Uh, it required the taking of Arab villages within or close to its defensive lines in order to prevent their use by hostile forces. Now, the inhabitants of villages that engaged in the fighting were to be expelled after any armed resistance was overcome, but villages that surrendered were to be administered with the inhabitants allowed to remain. Now, there were no rapes in Diyasin or gender-orientated uh, atrocities. The impact of these things that did not happen was, however, overwhelming. It boomeranged on the Palestinians. Um, following the rule of uh, women's honour before land, the movement, um, or I should say again, the, the, the moment that the Palestinians heard about rapes, they, they started to leave and, and that movement of people took place. And while there were tens of thousands of Arabs that had left the area before the Deir Yassin affair, their numbers dramatically increased after it. Now, it's impossible to identify the exact reasons that caused each of them to flee, but I think the available evidence makes it clear that the stories of Dear Yassin significantly contributed to that flight um, in a way that we simply can't you know, dismiss or, or underestimate. And the Jewish mainstream, and later the Israeli left, exploited the affair to blame the so-called dissidents of Lehi and Etzel, and later the Israeli right as murderers who blackened Israel's name in the world. The Palestinian establishment, creating the, the massacre narrative with these descriptions that contradicted the express testimony of the survivors, did so because they believed it was in the Palestinian interest. And then after uh, their decision to, to fabricate atrocities backfired by promoting waves of refugees, they doubled down on the narrative that Jews created the Palestinian refugee problem by their murderous acts such as the Dear Yassin narrative. 
um, and, and the so-called massacre. Now, um, I think just a couple of final important um, nuggets to, to take from the book, 70% of the uh, approximate 1,000 inhabitants of Deir Yassin managed to escape the attack because the attackers let them escape. 20% were taken prisoner and uh, later released, and 10% were killed. The ratio between the Arabs killed and injured, uh, which was about 100 each, also does not suggest a massacre. Um, even more indicative is the fact that double the number of Arabs uh, were taken prisoner as were killed. Um, and that's an even better metric, perhaps, because the decision to take individuals prisoner is an intentional act, uh, unlike it injuring people. And the fact that the overwhelming majority, 90 percent, survived the attack is the clearest refutation um, of the accusation of massacre. Finally, we come to independence. Israel's declaration of statehood. It was compiled over a fairly brief period of time, about three weeks from the third week of April 1948, right up to the hard deadline of the 14th of May, the day prior to the date scheduled by the British for the end of the mandate and their departure from the land. Now, crucially, it was a compromise agreed to um, under uh, pikuach nefesh, which might be described as the emergency provision in Jewish law, that principle that preserving human life trumps almost any strictly religious uh, consideration. There were many unanswered constitutional questions, especially about religion, um, and essentially the ability to achieve agreement on the draft was largely down to the fact that five Arab armies were about to invade the country. We hereby declare, it's uh, the modern equivalent of the biblical hinenu, an affirmation of presence and an assumption of responsibility. And it's the key passage in Israel's Declaration of Independence. Now I note that while the document is called the Declaration of Independence, it's in fact more of a proclamation of statehood. Uh, and there are differences. As Martin Kramer explains, not every state has a declaration of independence. Britain, France, Germany, Italy and Spain, for example, do not. Now, most states that do have declarations of independence had belonged to empires which they separated or ceded uh, from. And these were often in struggles of liberation. And so they declared independence uh, from another polity. Their declarations often include a long list of complaints against the misrule of those former overlords. Um, and it's often also followed by a call to arms. So, for example, the American Declaration of Independence, 1776, 70% of which is a litany of complaints against George III uh, and the Crown's repeated injuries and usurpations and his trampling on the liberties of the colonists. Now, the Yeshua have likewise waged a struggle against the repeated injuries and usurpations uh, of Britain under George VI. Britain had shut the doors of the Jewish national home to the Jews of Europe when they most needed it. And Britain's decision to give up Palestine, um, to give up the mandate, was doubtless in part as a result of the campaign waged uh, against it by the Jewish underground. Nevertheless, the Israeli declaration doesn't include a single grievance against the departing uh, imperial overlord, and we may wonder why. Well, the Zionist movement had already delivered a declaration of political independence through the Zionist Executive Council on the 12th of April. It declared its decision to establish in the country the high authority of our political independence immediately upon the end of the mandate, and no later than the 16th of May, there will come into being a Jewish provisional government. Now that saw the creation of the People's Administration, headed by David Ben-Gurion. The World Zionist Movement had resolved upon the end of the failed mandatory government to banish foreign rule um, over the land of Israel so that the people will be able to rise up and establish its independence in its homeland. 
But by the time of the declaration, the British were leaving. They didn't need to be thrown out. There would be no governing authority from which to declare independence. Now, the declaration doesn't even declare the state now. In its words, the state just comes into effect from the moment of the termination of the British mandate being tonight. So uh, not in opposition or in rebellion against anyone, but as the successor to the vacated authority. Now, the Jewish state in the Israeli declaration would arise on um, the 15th of May in a void resulting from the termination of the British mandate. The famous declaration of 1776 was a specific inspiration for Israel's declaration. One of the most interesting details in the history of the declaration, which Martin Kramer um, has written quite recently, is that uh, the Israeli document's first draft began with the US declaration translated into Hebrew and modified. Essentially, it shared the purpose of announcing to the world that the Jewish state was assuming what the American equivalent uh, called a separate and equal station in the world, empowered to do all the acts and things which independent states may of right do. And the new state would be like all other nations. It would be sovereign, not a protectorate or a ward of the United Nations, but a member. Now, if you ask most Israelis who declared the state, they will answer without hesitation, David Ben-Gurion. But the document itself says we, members of the People's Council, representatives of the Jewish community of Eretz Israel and of the Zionist movement. The declaration has two sources of authority, the Yeshuv in the land and the Zionist movement at large through these two constituencies um, represented on the People's Council. We ought to grapple with the suggestion that we often hear that the UN created Israel. And the key phrase in the proclamation is by virtue of our natural and historic right and on the strength of the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly, we hereby declare the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel to be known as the State of Israel. Even if it were within the power of the UN to create states, which it is not, the proclamation makes it clear that the primary sources of authority are the natural and historic right. It is by virtue of these that the state is proclaimed, and it is on the strength of the most recent recognition by the United Nations. Moreover, um, an earlier draft by Moshe Charette had claimed that during World War II, the Yeshuv had, by the blood of its soldiers and its war efforts, gained the right to be reckoned among the peoples who founded the United Nations. By rights then, one might argue that having fielded soldiers in the war effort, the Yeshuv uh, had already or should have already been recognized as a state and as a founding member of the UN itself. Now, all in all, Perhaps the uh, most forceful single argument for the Jewish state was the fact that by 1947, uh, in the words of Abba Eben, uh, the Yeshuv had become too large to be dominated by Arabs, too self-reliant to be confined by tutelage, uh, and too ferociously resistant to be thwarted in its main ambition. And ultimately, the first of uh, the two states' main claims to its foundation, natural right, echoes Thomas Jefferson's laws of nature and of nature's God in the American Declaration of Independence. Here that is complemented by the historic right and both are bolstered through having been recognized by the international community uh, in the form of the United Nations. Israel's Declaration of Independence was an announcement to the world also that in fact a, a new kind of Jew had been reborn in the land of Israel. Um, in the words of the late Meir Shamgar, who for 12 years served as president of Israel's Supreme Court, the Declaration of Independence was at once the birth certificate and the identity card of the state as a sovereign and independent entity. 
Now, this was uh, rebirth reflected in the choice of the name of the state as well. It was Ben-Gurion who first suggested Israel. Uh, it seemed strange at first, and the proposal was received um, pretty coolly. But members then tried pronouncing Israel government, Israel army, Israel citizen, Israel council, to see how, uh, how it sounded. And most were not particularly enthusiastic, but there were only 48 hours left. There was a lot of work to be done. The matter was put to a vote and seven of the 10 members who were present. But there was, I think, clearly a, a rupture in the choice of name also, in, in terms of the continuity, a, a break with the exilic Jewish past, rather than necessarily a bridge to the diaspora, the choice of the name Israel was about creating a, a new identity, building on the previous Jewish identity. Now, the Declaration of Independence established Israel as the only state to arise in former mandatory Palestine. It said nothing of a claim to the full borders of mandatory Palestine because it didn't need to. It referred to Eretz Israel. Now, the declaration purposefully left Israel open to the operation of international default rules, like uti possidetis juris. It's a rule of customary international law. I've spoken about it at great length. I wouldn't propose to go into its operation now unless there are specific questions about it. I just wanted to end by quoting from uh, Kramer's description of the ceremony. Um, and I hope, uh, I hope you'll see why. Um, he says, a wave of emotion swept the audience. Rabbi Fishman, who would later recall uh, looking out of the corner of his eye and glimpsing of all people, the radical Mapam heretic Aaron Ziesling, who had tried to keep any hint of God out of the declaration. This is what he saw. At the museum, when I recited the blessing in front of the nation's dignitaries, suddenly I saw Ziesling removing a handkerchief from his pocket and cover his bare head. Now, the anecdote cuts to the very essence of the paradox of what it means to be Jewish and what it means for a state to be Jewish. It's a nationality, it's a history, a culture, and a religion. And in each individual, as in the state as a whole, all of these elements coexist in different proportions and uh, immediate relevance, but each uh, with latently more significant potential. How to strike the right balance has been one of the greatest challenges facing the state of Israel. The debate over the state's declaration of independence was only the start.